Today we're going to look at a really cool limit of an integral that I found on the Math Stack Exchange. And keep a lookout for a really nice complex analysis result that we're going to use at the end. I'll make sure to point it out. Okay, so our goal is to find the limit is n goes to infinity of n times the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 1 minus the nth root of sine of x dx. Okay, so let's observe that this nth root of sine of x as n approaches infinity will approach 1. And that's because, well, the nth root of anything approaches 1 as n approaches infinity. I guess you kind of have to be careful here that you're dealing with positive numbers, but since x is between 0 and pi over 2, sine will be, well, non-negative, I should say. Another thing we'd like to notice is that since we have this n out here, which is approaching infinity, and this thing is approaching 1 minus 1, we have an indeterminate form of type infinity times zero. So let's see how we can approach this. I'm actually gonna start off with a change of variables in the limit or a substitution for the limit, however you wanna think about it. So let's do that here. So what I'll do is I'll take n or maybe I'll take t and set it equal to one over n. So let's notice as n approaches infinity, t will approach 0 from above. And that's going to turn this into a limit as t approaches 0 from above of the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 1 minus sine of x to the t power dx over t. But now, putting it like this, well, we in fact have an indeterminate form of type infinity over infinity. And, well, we can use L'Hopital's rule for that. And here we'll differentiate under the integral sign, but that's okay here because everything is continuous and, well, we have smooth partial derivatives. Okay, so let's get at it. So applying L'Hopital's rule, we'll have this limit as t goes to 0 from above. The denominator will differentiate to 1, so I'll just leave that off. And then we'll have our integral from 0 to pi over 2. The derivative of 1 is like obviously equal to 0. And then, well, we're taking the derivative with respect to t here. So we've got to recall what we do when we've got an exponential function where the base is not equal to e. And here, this will give us sine of x to the t times the natural log of sine of x dx. But this is attached to a minus sign, which maybe I'll bring in front of the whole limit. So something like that. But next up, we can bring the limit inside of the integral, and that's by the dominated convergence theorem. And here, I'll just point out the dominating function. Observe that our integrand, which is the absolute Observe that the absolute value of our integrand, which is sine of x to the t times natural log of sine of x, is less than or equal to the natural log of sine of x on this interval. But the natural log of sine of x is integrable, so we're allowed to bring this limit inside. But if we bring this limit inside and let t approach 0 from above, well, then that sine of x term is going to go to 1, which leaves us with negative the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of our natural log of sine of x dx. And this is actually a well-known integral that we've calculated on the channel before. That being said, we're going to do it again in a totally different way using, well, like I said before, the Gauss mean value theorem. So I'm going to start by multiplying this integral by 4 over 4. In other words, the number 1. But then I'm actually going to use the 4 in the numerator to change a couple of things. First of all, I'll use the fact that sine is symmetric about the line pi over 2, or about the point pi over 2, to extend this from an integral from 0 to pi over 2 to an integral from 0 to pi. So that takes care of, well, half of the 4. 
and that'll leave me with a number two that's outside. But I'm gonna bring that number two inside of the natural log and put a square here. Okay, so that takes into account this four that I multiplied in the numerator. But now I'm gonna use a power reducing formula on that sine squared. And that's gonna leave me with minus one quarter, the integral from zero to pi of the natural log of one minus cosine of two x over two dx. So like I said, we're using a power reducing formula here. And now we're gonna take this one minus cosine of two x and rewrite it with a complex exponential. But let's do the calculation that that involves over here, just because I think it's a kind of an interesting calculation. So let's take one minus e to the two i x and multiply it with one minus e to the minus two i x. So let's multiply that out. So that's gonna give us one times one, which is one. And then this minus e to the two i x times minus e to the minus two i x. But in that case, the exponents will cancel and we'll get a plus one from that. And then we'll have minus e to the two i x plus e to the minus two i x. Okay, great. But now let's notice that by Euler's formula, this bit right here will add up to two times cosine of two x and then one plus one by arithmetic will add up to the number two. So here we have two minus two cosine two x. Okay, but then if we multiply that by one over four or we divide it by four, we gain what's inside of this natural log. So that means that I can take this object right here, this product of these complex exponentials, divide them by four and put them inside the natural log. So let's just do that. So we've got minus quarter, and then we've got our integral from zero to pi over two of natural log of one minus e to the two i x, one minus e to the minus two i x over four dx. So let's start with that integral and see that we're actually almost done. So there I've got transposed up where we ended. And now we're gonna use this Gauss mean value theorem. But before we do that, let's observe that we've got a natural log of a product in the numerator and then a number in the denominator. And that's gonna allow us to, you know, maybe break this into pieces using logarithm rules. I'm gonna also maybe absorb this minus sign inside to change the order of addition and subtraction. So that'll leave me with one quarter, and then I'll have my integral from zero to pi. I've got the natural log of four minus the natural log of one minus e to the two i x, and then minus the natural log of uh, e one minus e to the minus two i x, and then that is all within our integral. And now for the Gauss mean value theorem, which says this. So assuming that F is analytic, on some sort of circle containing Z, we have F of Z is equal to the integral from zero to pi of F of Z plus R e to the i theta. But then by doing a substitution, which makes the wrap around Z faster, if you will, that's the same thing as two times the integral from zero to pi of f of z plus e to the i two theta d theta. And that's the situation that we have. So that means that when we integrate out this term right here, well, we're gonna get, um, well, just by dividing by two, we'll get one half the natural log of one. Because check it out, the role of z is being played by one here. Notice there's a minus sign in there, but there's a version of this where we have a minus instead of a plus, that's okay. Um, and then this next one, you have the same sort of thing. Instead of wrapping around counterclockwise, this one's wrapping around clockwise, but you get a similar result. And you could transform this object into this object via substitution as well. So this is gonna give us, well, maybe it's gonna be something like, I don't know, plus or minus the natural log of one, but it doesn't really matter because the natural log of one is zero. So both of those are just gonna turn into zero. 
And that leaves us with a quarter times the integral from zero to pi of natural log of four, which is gonna be pi over four times the natural log of four. But then we can bring one of those twos from the denominator into the natural log and take the square root of four, leaving us with two, and we'll have pi over two times the natural log of two. And there we have it. We found the value of the limit of our integral, and that's a good place to stop.